As for Jeremy Renner's portrayal of Hawkeye, it's kind of hard for me to say if I fully liked his character portrayal of Hawkeye, since 90% of the movie, he was pretty much brainwashed. But it was interesting seeing Hawkeye on the big screen, and I would love to see his relationship with Black Widow further develop in future Avengers The best thing about this movie was the fact that it was in a world where humans and cartoon characters live side by side each other. I found this really interesting because it was rare for me to see a film where the story takes place in the world where humans and cartoon characters live together. And the fact that the cartoon characters are treated something like second-class citizens... But what I really thing. loved about this movie was how each character was being presented and explored. I love the way that the movie showed us the relationship between Mephasa and Simba, as it's clear from the very beginning that Mephasa truly cares about his son Simba and would do anything to protect him from any harm. The same is said about Simba as he truly looked up to his father and wanted to be just like him. Now... I would like to discuss about the animation. I really love the animation of this film as it was similar to many of the Disney films of that era. And I love the way that the animation really brought out the beauty of the Nutcracker Ballet. Especially the dance sequences when between Dorothy and her Clara pet hen Belina arrive in Oz, they discover that the Gnome King has taken over Oz and that the Scarecrow, who was the King of Oz, had been kidnapped by the Gnome King. Why the citizens, including the Tins woods Woodsman and the Cowardly Lion, were all turned to stone. Now Dorothy, along with her new friends Jack Pumpkinhead, the Guff, and TikTok, must save the Scarecrow from the look at. The cover of this comic was fantastic, as Brent Anderson did a brilliant job of detailing the artwork for the cover, as the artwork has the X-Men members, Cyclops, Wolverine, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, and Storm, all posing in a great stance, while the background is in green coloring, with images from this comic. The story takes place after the events of the Phoenix Saga, where Jean Grey first discovers her Phoenix powers. In this story, it turns out that the Hellfire Club, which consists of Emma Frost, Sebastian Shaw, and Mastermind, found out about Jean Grey's Phoenix powers, and wanted to use the Phoenix powers for their own game. Scott Snyder really brought all the characters to life in the story, especially Dick Grayson as he takes on the role that I never would have thought that he would ever take on. It's so surprising to see Dick Grayson become Batman, because usually when I read a Batman comic, Bruce Wayne was using the one who takes oh, on the Batman. fantastic in this comic, as it looks a bit scratchy in some places, but the characters are drawn realistically enough that I found myself being immersed with the detailed artwork. I also love the way that Fiona Staples did the paintings for any scene that has fire and explosions, as they look truly realistic and dramatic. Jim Lee's art is probably the best part of this entire story. All of the characters look truly fantastic, especially with Batman looking as brooding as he normally does, and the scenes where Batman is out in the open in the storm with lightning in the background was truly gorgeous to see. I also love the way that Jim Lee made everything glow on the page as it made the characters ended after the first movie, the Rugrats movie, or do you think it should have ended after the All Grown Up special? I personally think it should have ended after the All Grown Up special because... To me, it provided a sort of closure on the Rugrats experience as children as they are thinking about what they would be like if they grow up. So what's your opinion on this? Please feel free to comment below. Steam issues. To me, it made this show very relatable to the audience and is able to tell kids about the tough issues of life and how to deal with them with a straight face, while you're making the show more understandable for young children. Probably one of the most controversial issues that stemmed from the show was the po possible fact that Helga's mother, Mary McCaffrey, I actually found all the games on the show to be entertaining and engaging for anyone, but my personal favorite games on the show were Distraction News, where you have to listen to what topic the newscaster is discussing about, while I try not to be distracted by the bizarre imagery that pops up all over the screen, and it also spawned a TV movie called The Archies and Jugman, which premiered on Nickelodeon Sunday Movie Tunes in 2002 and was about the Archie gang meeting up with a K-Man version of Jughead. Archie's Rear Mysteries also briefly continued its run through the comic books that started in 1999, and then it is run after anyway, 34 issues. What I did like about the series was the fact that the same voice actors who voiced the original Rugrats, Chero Chase, who voiced Angelica Pickles, and Kree Summer, who voiced Susie, are voicing these characters again. And every time I heard their voices, I'm always reminded of watching the same characters from Rugrats, which I have so many fond memories of watching when I was little. And many, many more. Many of the other X-Men characters have good storylines that can make them really stand out in their stories, like Storm's encounter with the Shadow King, or Rogue's past as being a former villain, and nearly taking all of Miss Marvel's powers. So far, the only other X-Men character who has his own series is Gambit. So, if the comic book movie did actually stay true to its source material, would it make the movie much better? I personally think it all depends on the source material that is given. If the source material is really good, then I say, why not? 
But if the source material was terrible and the movie was only trying to improve on the source material by changing the material, then I, think I understand that, that the big difference between the X-Men and the other superheroes is that the X-Men are mutants. Why the other superheroes either got their superpowers through accidents or were super soldiers. But it's still a complicated issue, since most of the X-Men, except for Nightcrawler and other mutants that have problems with their appearances, look like any I think other that a TV normal series movie. could cover all that history in the span of several seasons and also add more interesting twists to the original story. I also would love to see Nightwing have various adventures in Gotham City, fighting crime and having his relationships with Barbara Gordon, Tim Drake, and Bruce Wayne explored through the TV series. Who has the rights to most of the Avengers franchise? Should they get the rights back to Spider-Man, X-Men, and Fantastic Four so that they could join up with the Avengers? Now, as far as whether or not the X-Men, Spider-Man, and Fantastic Four movies will be able to stick more closely to the source material if they are owned by Marvel, In 2001, Nickelodeon aired The Fairly Odd Parents, which was created by Butch Hartman, and originally started out in Oh Yeah Cartoons in 1998. It is also the third longest running Nicktoon on Nickelodeon next to Rugrats and SpongeBob SquarePants. However, drastic changes came to the network in 2007, when Cartoon Network aired their first original live action series, Out of Jimmy's Head, which is based off the movie Reanimated. After the presentation of Out of Jimmy's Head, Cartoon Network began airing other live-action shows, such as showing live-action movies doing the flicks, which is a movie block that replaced Cartoon yeah, um, Network's cartoon. The theme of the movie itself, and I would always, I remember when I was little, I would always listen to it all the time on VHS, and I actually still have the VHS to the Casper movie, um, and I still listen to it to this very day. So my favorite movie soundtrack is definitely um, James Horner's music from Casper, the first Hey everyone, movie. this is Rabbit's Blog, and welcome to my 150th video celebration. In this video, I'm going to do a question and answer session, and I had, um... Before, weeks ago, I had asked everybody to um, ask me any kind of questions that deal with comic books, with movies, with TV series, whatever. And so in this video, I'm going to answer all of your questions. Comic book pick number three, Ultimate Spider-Man Learning Curve, Volume 2. Written by Brian Michael Bendis, authored by Mark Bagley, published by Marvel Comics, Era 2000s. In this volume, Peter Parker's still going around town as Spider-Man, saving people's lives. Now, all the but Sandman Peter characters feeling remorse for Dream's death. Not only do we see the characters feeling great sadness for the death of Dream, but the readers will also feel sadness at seeing the Sandman series come to a close. I love the fact that this volume focuses more on the other characters mourning for Morpheus' death, as it provides great closer to the Sandman series, and it really delves into the issue. Comic pick number three, Batman the Long Halloween. Written by Jeff Loeb, artwork by Tim Sale published by DC Comics, era 1990s. In this com comic, Harvey Dent, Batman, and Captain James Gordon were all having a hard time trying to bring down Gotham City's most infamous comic book pick number one, Superman's Secret Identity. Written by Kurt Busiek, or by Stuart Imonen, published by DC Comics, era 2000s. In this story, we're in an alternate universe of Superman, where a young boy named Clark Kent, who is named after the real... Comic book pick number four, The Sandman Season of Mist, Volume 4, written by Neil Gaiman, artwork by Kelly Jones, Mike Dringerberg, Malcolm Jones III, Matt Wagner, Dick Giordano, George Pratt, and P. Craig Russell. Published by Vertical Comics, era 1990s. Colossus Beating Up Ord After Colossus is resurrected, Kitty Pryde takes him up to meet up with the other X-Men. And what do we get? We get to see Colossus pummeling Orr to the ground once he discovers that he was responsible for him getting tortured all those years. And what better way for Colossus to show his anger than for him to have this memorable saying, I am not made of steel. I mean, I like um, Dr. Eggman, too, but um, I think with Eggman, it's like used more to describe the shape of Dr. Robotnik rather than, it's like, um, well, well, once it's like CGI animation. You know, once you make it, you can't unmake it. Like, even if traditional animation is in that um, phase where they're not as popular anymore, there's always a market out there that still enjoys traditional animation. Like, there's still other countries out there that make a lot of cartoons Almost that are traditional. All the songs in the movie. So, um, this is pretty much my top five favorite songs from The Nightmare Before Christmas. So, let's start. Um, number five is Making Christmas. And this is the song where um, Jack... 
um, orders to um, everybody in Halloween Town to start making presents, and everybody in Halloween Town story. starts. Making... And as long as the characters are done in the spirit of the book, then personally, I have no problems with um, the source material being changed a bit from the movies because I understand that with um, movies, you know, they have a lot of things have to be changed to um fit in with the screen big time screens like for example Every situation if, happens that change the character's um life story style or just changes um the show the direction of the show itself so how would you um prevent a show from jumping the shark well here are some ways i think um you could prevent a show from jumping the shark one of them is to make sure the show doesn't run for too long i noticed that a lot of shows that run for